Story five of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five The Revenge of the Adolphus Parts five through seven. Five. They, on the Chancellorville, sometimes could see into the bay, and they perceived the enemy's gunboats moving out as if to give battle. Surrey feared that this impulse would not endure, or that it was some mere pretense for the edification of the town's people and the garrison, so he hastily signalled the Holy Moses and the Chicken to go in. Thankful for small favours, they came on like charging bantams. The battery had ceased firing. As the two auxiliaries passed under the stern of the cruiser, the megaphone hailed them. "'You will see the enemy soon as you round the point. A fine chance. Good luck.' As a matter of fact, the Spanish gunboats had not been informed of the presence of the Holy Moses and the chicken off the bar, and they were just blustering down the bay over the protective shoals to make it appear that they scorned the Chancellorville. But suddenly, from around the point, there burst into view a steam yacht, closely followed by a harbor tug. The gunboats took one swift look at this horrible sight and fled, screaming. Lieutenant Rygate, commanding the Holy Moses, had under his feet a craft that was capable of some speed, although before a solemn tribunal one would have to admit that she conscientiously belied almost everything that the contractors had said of her originally. Boatswain Pent, commanding the chicken, was in possession of an utterly different kind. The Holy Moses was an antelope. The chicken was a man who could carry a piano on his back. In this race, Pent had the mortification of seeing his vessel outstripped badly. The entrance of the two American craft had had a curious effect upon the shores of the bay. Apparently, everyone had slept in the assurance that the Chancellorville could not cross the bar, and that the Chancellorville was the only hostile ship. Consequently, the appearance of the Holy Moses and the Chicken created a curious and complete emotion. Rygate, on the bridge of the Holy Moses, laughed when he heard the bugles shrilling, and saw through his glasses the wee figures of men running hither and thither on the shore. It was the panic of the china when the bull entered the shop. The whole bay was bright with sun. Every detail of the shore was plain. From a brown hut a beam of the Holy Moses, some little men ran out waving their arms and turning their tiny faces to look at the enemy. Directly ahead, some four miles, appeared the scattered white houses of a town with a wharf, and some schooners in front of it. The gunboats were making for the town. There was a stone fort on the hill, overshadowing, but Rygate conjectured that there was no artillery in it. There was a sense of something intimate and impudent in the minds of the Americans. It was like climbing over a wall and fighting a man in his own garden. It was not that they could be in any wise shaken in their resolve. It was simply that the overwhelmingly Spanish aspect of things made them feel like gruff intruders. Like many of the emotions of wartime, this emotion had nothing at all to do with war. Rygate's only commissioned subordinate called up from the bow-gun, "'May I open fire, sir? I think I can fetch that last one.' "'Yes.' Immediately the six-pounder crashed, and in the air was the spinning-wire noise of the flying shot. It struck so close to the last gunboat that it appeared that the spray went aboard. The swift-handed men at the gun spoke of it. "'Gave em a bath that time, anyhow. First one they've ever had.' Dry em off this time, Jim. The young ensign said, Steady! And so the Holy Moses raced in, firing, until the whole town, fort, waterfront, and shipping, were as plain as if they had been done on paper by a mechanical draftsman. The gunboats were trying to hide in the bosom of the town. One was frantically tying up to the wharf, and the other was anchoring within a hundred yards of the shore. The Spanish infantry, of course, had dug trenches along the beach, and suddenly the air over the Holy Moses sung with bullets. 
The shore line thrummed with musketry. Also some antique shells screamed. VI The chicken was doing her best. Pent's posture at the wheel seemed to indicate that her best was about thirty-four knots. In his eagerness he was braced as if he alone was taking in a ten-thousand-ton battleship through Hellgate. But the chicken was not too far in the rear, and Pent could see clearly that he was to have no minor part to play. Some of the antique shells had struck the Holy Moses, and he could see the escaped steam shooting up from her. She lay close inshore and was lashing out with four six-pounders, as if this was the last opportunity she would have to fire them. She had made the Spanish gunboats very sick. A solitary gun on the one moored to the wharf was from time to time firing wildly. Otherwise the gunboats were silent. But the beach in front of the town was a line of fire. The chicken headed for the Holy Moses, and as soon as possible the six-pounder in her bow began to crack at the gunboat moored to the wharf. In the meantime the Chancellorville prowled off the bar, listening to the firing, anxious, acutely anxious, and feeling her impotency in every inch of her small steel frame. And in the meantime the Adolphus squatted on the waves and brazenly waited for news. One could thoughtfully count the seconds and reckon that in this second and that second a man had died, if one chose, but no one did it. Undoubtedly the spirit was that the flag should come away with honour, honour complete, perfect, leaving no loose unfinished end over which the Spaniards could erect a monument of satisfaction, glorification. The distant guns boomed to the ears of the silent blue jackets at their stations on the cruiser. The chicken steamed up to the Holy Moses, and took into her nostrils the odor of steam, gunpowder, and burnt things. Rifle bullets simply steamed over them both. In the merest flash of time, Pent took into his remembrance the body of a dead quartermaster on the bridge of his consort. The two megaphones uplifted together, but Pent's eager voice cried out first, "'Are you injured, sir?' "'No, not completely. My engines can get me out after—after after we have sunk those gunboats.' The voice had been utterly conventional, but it changed to sharpness. "'Go in and sink that gunboat at anchor.' As the chicken rounded the Holy Moses and started inshore, a man called to him from the depths of finished disgust. "'They're taken to their boat, sir!' Pent looked and saw the men of the anchored gunboat lower their boats and pull like mad for shore. The chicken, assisted by the Holy Moses, began a methodical killing of the anchored gunboat. The Spanish infantry on shore fired frenziedly at the chicken. Pent, giving the wheel to a waiting sailor, stepped out to a point where he could see the men at the guns. One bullet spanged past him and into the pilot-house. He ducked his head into the window. "'That hit you, Murray?' he inquired with interest. Uh, "'No, sir,' cheerfully responded the man at the wheel. Pent became very busy superintending the fire of his absurd battery. The anchored gunboat simply would not sink. It evinced that unnatural stubbornness which is sometimes displayed by inanimate objects. The gunboat at the wharf had sunk as if she had been scuttled, but this riddled thing at anchor would not even take fire. Pent began to grow flurried, privately. He could not stay there forever. Why didn't the damn gunboat admit its destruction? Why— He was at the forward gun— when one of his engine-room force came to him and, after saluting, said serenely, "'The men at the after-gun are all down, sir.' It was one of those curious lifts which an enlisted man, without in any way knowing it, can give his officer. The impudent tranquillity of the man at once set Pent to rights, and the stoker departed, admiring the extraordinary coolness of his captain. The next few moments contained little but heat, an odor, applied mechanics, and an expectation of death. Pent developed a fervid and amazed appreciation of the men. 
his men, men he knew very well, but strange men. What explained them? He was doing his best because he was captain of the chicken, and he lived or died by the chicken. But what could move these men to watch his eye in bright anticipation of his orders, and then obey them with enthusiastic rapidity? What caused them to speak of the action as some kind of a joke, particularly when they knew he could overhear them? What manner of men? And he anointed them secretly with his fullest affection. Perhaps Pent did not think all this during the battle. Perhaps he thought it so soon after the battle that his full mind became confused as to the time. At any rate, it stands as an expression of his feeling. The enemy had gotten a field-gun round to the shore, and with it they began to throw three-inch shells at the chicken. In this war it was usual that the downtrodden Spaniards, in their ignorance, should use smokeless powder, while the Americans, by the power of the consistent everlasting three-ply wire-woven double-back-action imbecility of a hayseed government, used powder which on sea and on land cried their position to heaven, and accordingly good men got killed without reason. At first Pent could not locate the field-gun at all, but as soon as he found it he ran aft with one man and brought the after six-pounder again into action. He paid little heed to the old gun-crew. One was lying on his face apparently dead, another was prone with a wound in the chest, while the third sat with his back to the deck-house holding a smitten arm. This last one called out huskily, "'Give em hell, sir!' The minutes of the battle were either days, years, or they were flashes of a second. Once Pent, looking up, was astonished to see three shell-holes in the chicken's funnel, made surreptitiously, so to speak. "'If we don't silence that field-gun, she'll sink us, boys!' The eyes of the man sitting with his back against the deck-house were looking from out his ghastly face at the new gun-crew. He spoke with the supreme laziness of a wounded man. "'Give him hell!' Pent felt a sudden twist of his shoulder. He was wounded, slightly. The anchored gunboat was in flames. 7. Pent took his little blood-stained towboat out to the Holy Moses. The yacht was already under way for the bay entrance. As they were passing out of range, the Spaniards heroically redoubled their fire which is their custom. Pent, moving busily about the decks, stopped suddenly at the door of the engine-room. His face was set, and his eyes were steely. He spoke to one of the engineers. "'During the action I saw you firing at the enemy with a rifle. I told you once to stop, and then I saw you at it again. Pegging away with a rifle is no part of your business. I want you to understand that you are in trouble.' The humbled man did not raise his eyes from the deck. Presently the Holy Moses displayed an anxiety for the chicken's health. "'One killed and four wounded, sir. Have you enough men left to work your ship?' After deliberation Pent answered, "'No, sir. Shall I send you assistance?' "'No, sir. I can get to sea all right.' As they neared the point, they were edified by the sudden appearance of a serial comic ally. The Chancellorville at last had been unable to stand the strain, and had sent in her launch with an ensign, five seamen, and a number of marksmen marines. She swept hot-foot around the point, bent on terrible slaughter. The one-pounder of her bow presented a formidable appearance. The Holy Moses and the Chicken laughed until they brought indignation to the brow of the young ensign, but he forgot it when, with some of his men, he boarded the Chicken to do what was possible for the wounded. The nearest surgeon was aboard the Chancellorville. There was absolute silence on board the cruiser as the Holy Moses steamed up to report. The Blue Jackets listened with all their ears. The commander of the yacht spoke slowly into his megaphone. We have destroyed the two gunboats, sir. 
There was a burst of confused cheering on the forecastle of the Chancellorville, but an officer's cry quelled it. "'Very good. Will you come aboard?' Two correspondents were already on the deck of the cruiser. Before the last of the wounded were hoisted aboard the cruiser, the Adolphus was on her way to Key West. When she arrived at that port of desolation, Shackles fled to file the telegrams, and the other correspondents fled to the hotel for clothes, good clothes, clean clothes, and food, good food, much food, and drink, much drink, any kind of drink. Days afterward, when the officers of the noble squadron received the newspapers containing an account of their performance, they looked at each other somewhat dejectedly. Heroic assault, grand daring of Boatswain Pent, superb accuracy of the Holy Moses fire, gallant taws of the chicken, their name should be remembered as long as America stands, terrible losses of the enemy. When the Secretary of the Navy ultimately read the report of Commander Surrey, S.O.P., he had to prick himself with a dagger in order to remember that anything at all out of the ordinary had occurred. End of Section 8